what made you believe that being a, using the greedy algorithm would work? Was it just only because you tested against the example? Where's your design? You yeah. all you've done is really just kind of kind of hand waved the design. You just said, um, "Oh yeah, I'm going to do this." It, it, like these kind of interviews where the candidate usually doesn't design the algorithm and and or doesn't have like a very clear roadmap ahead it's either very very good or very very bad and i would say it weighted more towards the bad i think on a 70 30 level okay yeah so uh i'm currently uh do i mention like my personal details or um okay? however much however much you want to tell me um again like because i'm recording this uh it may or may not go up so you know just tell me as much as you think will help you okay so uh i'm a master's student doing my electrical engineering uh but i'm pretty much interested in software so i'm currently interning as a software in uh, intern at samsung right now mm -hmm. and that's going on until like december so i'm also applying for uh, uh internships next summer so i'm just like uh, when i was reading your guide i saw that point about like how you said uh getting consistent offers so I'd like, uh, so I, I decided to like try for that for next summer. Mm -hmm. So I'm just looking for like uh, any, like if you notice any like glaring uh, mistakes in my thought process and stuff like that. Okay. So you're basically aiming for one year from now. Oh uh, yeah. Next summer. Yeah. Wow. Because like uh, positions have already opened. So it's not like I'm um, early or anything. So. Got it. You're trying to beat your, it's the fall rush. Got it. Yeah. Okay, so then uh, you looked at the so you've read my guide, you've read you've read what to do. I assume you've tried some problems on your own. Yeah, yeah, but so uh, like thing is though because like uh, I'm electrical engineering, I've never actually taken an official like data structures and algorithms class. Okay. So uh, I know like there's some like uh, like uh, gaps in my knowledge. Like as of right now, like I'm not too sure about the theory about heaps and like backtracking like certain things. Uh, but I'm just trying to fill them up, like, uh, as much as I can. I see. Um, well, if it's a technical knowledge basis, then mm -hmm. that is something that you, that can only be solved with studying. Nothing I say mm -hmm. is really going to fix that. It's go like, what I'm here to do is to unblock you if there's any mm -hmm. problems in your thinking. But yeah, if yeah. it's purely a conceptual thing, then you can look it up for our, on YouTube for free. So... Yeah, yeah, I, I was just, uh, like, letting you know, like, where I was standing. Like, yeah, I don't expect you to, like, teach me that stuff right now, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I just don't think it would be a very good use of your time or my time for me to just, you know, mm -hmm. teach you heaps. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. So you're in the middle, uh, you're, you're just, you have, you've never taken a software engineering class, computer science class. And so, okay, when you do these problems, what do you find yourself <laughs> struggling the most with? Um, I guess the, uh, the most difficult thing I'd find was like, uh, when it comes to like, uh, kind of advanced data structures, like graphs and stuff, I find it a bit difficult to like recognize those problems when they're given like, uh, like, uh, a bit like, uh, how would I say like when it's a, when the, uh, the problems, like a story kind of like that, uh, where there's no, when there, it's not like it's given as a graph, like that sort of stuff. I find it difficult to like think of it as a graph and like, you know, uh, how apply algorithms like BFS and DFS and stuff like that. Okay. Recognizing graph problems. Yeah, I would say that's a thing. What about, uh, can you recognize tree problems? Uh, trees are, I mean, uh, from what I've seen, at least trees are like pretty much kind of given, like it's a tree. So I know immediately of that I should think of it as a tree and like try to think of other problems of trees that I've seen before and try to like, uh, recognize any pattern that I've seen, but then Sometimes that's not the case for graphs, I feel. Okay, um, elaborate, because the way I see trees and graphs, they're, all, they're pretty similar. The only difference is that graphs, you can have it's just a cycle. You can have a cycle with a tree, that's, that's it. And it's bi-directional. Uh, like, uh, I mean, like, uh, so, uh, how do I say this? Like, um, like, there are some examples on deep code literature, uh, kind of famous, like, um, like, you know, there's that water flow question. Okay. Uh, uh, like, Pacific water flow. Atlantic. Uh, so, um, how do I say? Uh, so it's like uh, the que It's not. Uh, they don't tell you that it's a graph question. So, like, once I'm able to think of it as a graph, uh, I'm able to like kind of see the logic. But then, uh, 
like when I look at the question immediately, like I could, I go on a different tangent. Like maybe I think of dynamic programming or I think of this sort of regular array question. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, I get confused on what, well, like how to tackle the question exactly. So your goal is to be able to recognize graphs. This is what you want to try to do? I guess so, yeah. I mean, that's one of the problems, I, I guess. How good is your recognition of other, of other data structures and algorithms? I think the other ones are pretty fine, I guess. Like, uh, if you have any questions, I I don't I love to try them, and then maybe maybe you can find any flaws in my thinking or something like that. Yeah, because what I'm thinking is that well, if you're having trouble recognizing graphs, then just do more graph problems, and then you'll recognize them. But if you still struggle with that, then something mm-hmm. tells me that it's your ability to parse problems and recognize what structure you need. So that's uh, what I'm maybe. aiming at. This, this is what I'm aiming at, actually. So I need to figure out which problem to give you. Um, something okay. that's pretty ambiguous. So I might need to give you something a little bit harder, not like an easier problem. Because like with a lot of the medium problems, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but mm-hmm. with the harder problems, it might not necessarily be. Yeah, that's maybe. Yeah, that, I think that would uh, help me. Okay. I, I think I have... I think I know what problem to give, but it's... Let me see if I can find it. Give me a second. Then, um, if it's a hard question, like uh, since I've been preparing only for internships, I haven't prepared that many hard questions, so I might really struggle on it. Just Perfect, so. that's great. The more mistakes you make, the more I can tell you how much you suck, and I get the more mis- and I can point out more things in your pro- in your thinking. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Let's go. So let me know if you've seen this one before. Ooh, that was okay. big. Um, hold up. Let me resize it. Um. So basically. You have a problem where people owe each other money. Um, mm-hmm. So then Alice pays bo- Alice paid for bo- Bill's lunch for ten dollars. Chris gave mm-hmm. Alex five dollars for a taxi ride, and then we can model each of these as like a tuple, uh, where you have uh, zero, one, and two representing the number representing the uh, person. So the person at index zero is going to be Alice. The person at index one is going to be Bill, and the person at index two is going to be Chris. Okay. Okay. Follow me so far. Now, mm-hmm. these are going to be how we resolve, this is like the number, these are the transactions and the amount of money that is being paid and owed to uh, people. So the question we want to solve is how do we, what's the minimum number of transactions that we need in order to resolve the debts? So going back to the, for in going, if we had input of 0, 1, and 10, it would be that person, it would be that um, Alice paid uh, that $1. Mm-hmm. And then Al- that person paid that one dollar uh, for ten dollars, right? Because Alice paid for Bob for Bill, because Bill is at index number one, right? Yeah, yeah. And then paid index number two, uh, paid five dollars, right? So yeah. that's Chris. So if I put two in the first one, that means that Chris gave Alice, so because Chris is ID two. So okay, okay. So does, is the problem clear? Yeah, so uh, basically the number of transactions and the first digit is the person who's giving it. The second digit is the person who's getting the money and the third amounts the actual uh, value of the money, right? Yeah, so it's, um, so if uh, if I have zero, yeah, zero is, let's just say that the first index is from and then one is two and then and and two is the amount. So in the case of, uh, and, Al- and as we said before, Alice, Bill, Chris are 0, 1, 2, respectively. So 0, 1, 10 represents that the money Alice paid for Bill's lunch. Okay. So in a sense, if Alice is giving Bill $10. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, got it. Okay. Um... Can I just take a minute to take as think much about... time as you need, dude?
Okay, yeah. So uh, the first thing I'm thinking of is like first get all the players like who are participating. So that would be like um, zero, one, one, and two. And like while uh, traversing along, I just like uh, maintain uh, like how much is in their account. Like assuming everybody starts with zero, zero, zero. Mm-hmm. So in the first one, uh, since zero gives one ten dollars, zero would be minus ten. Uh, one would be ten, and then in the second account, uh, two would be minus five, and I would uh, accordingly sum it up, uh, like while I'm uh, going up on. So uh, zero gets five, so minus ten would then become minus five. Mm-hmm. Um, so. And then I'm um, thinking of getting uh, whoever has the max amount of money in their account. So uh, he'd be paying it off first. So Mm-hmm. Uh, wait. Yeah, uh, so in this case, so uh, I would choose a maximum, so 10. Uh, and then I would go along the other uh, participants. And if there's negative, if they're less than zero, then I would basically um, like uh, uh, I would give that money back from the maximum to uh, the negative to settle them up to zero. Um, and then I would do that until the maximum uh, went to zero, and then I choose the second maximum and do the same. Okay. So, uh, what what are your steps? I I haven't heard like a solid plan yet. Okay, so um, first, I guess I create like a hash map to uh, declare all the participants and how much their accounts are. Okay. And then I'd find the maximum. So, uh, yeah. So while I basically create a maximum uh, while loop. And so I'd, I'd, get, I'd get the maximum and then I'd loop over the other participants, whichever are negative. I um, like subtract the amount from both and add it onto the one which is negative to settle the negative one up to zero. And then uh, if the maximum one goes to zero, I'd choose the second maximum and then again and again. Okay. Yeah, so. Is that okay? Mm, sure. I mean, you seem like you have a plan, so you can go ahead and do what you, what you need to do. Okay.
So, you've been typing for a while. Um, my question um, yeah, is, just, what are you trying to do? Uh, okay, yeah. So, I'm just testing it. So, uh, basically, I've got a like a hash map setup, which holds the participant uh, like ID 0 or 2, 1. And the the amount of value, uh, the amount of money which is in their account. Sure. So uh, initially, I like set up the hash map. So I go along the transaction, and I uh, put in each money and subtract or minus depending on whether the guy is like giving or taking money. Mm-hmm. That's over here. Okay, and then, uh, and then, I get the. Uh, the person who has the max amount of money in their account. So I haven't written this function yet, sure. uh, this, but this basically just finds the, uh, the the guy who has the max amount of money. So uh, while I've kept the max amount of money at, as greater than zero, I uh, iterate over the other participants, which is basically, and go along the ones which have uh, money less than zero in their account. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if the absolute value of the money uh, of that person is greater than the max amount of money, which means like uh, someone owes like a negative 50, but uh, someone only has 20 in their account. Okay. Um, so basically I've, uh, I've set up uh, so that uh, the person who owes only 50 gets only $20, which is uh, plus or equal to the max amount of money. Mm-hmm. And I've set that person, whoever has the max amount of money equal to zero. Okay. And then I've, uh, I I get again the person who I, I go, go along the next person who has the the max amount of money in their account. So uh, this is if the someone owes more money than whoever has the most amount of money in their account. Otherwise, then I can just give uh, how much ever money to break even, which is setting that part to spend to zero, and I've just subtracted that amount of money from the max amount of money. I see. So you're going for a greedy algorithm here. Uh yeah, okay. basically. Okay. And. Um, I then I I trade uh, plus one for a number of transactions. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, if this is okay, I can. Well, okay. So, I mean, what's your standard for okay? You keep asking me if this is okay. What are you expecting for me to say? Um, how optimized do you think this is? Not very. I think um, there, you do have like actually quite a few bugs in here and a few optimizations you missed. Okay. Um, do you have any like test cases I could check up on because I'm trying to this one and yeah, sure. Um, so suppose I we, suppose we have like um, let me divide the accounts um, arbitrarily. So I, let's suppose I have accounts with like four positive balance of four five and then minus um, negative four, negative three, and negative two. Um, and so your algorithm would first take the account with, um, what's it called? Uh, it would take the amount of five because you're trying to find the max, right? And then oh, what wait, you would, uh, I didn't quite get this example. Well, what do you mean? For so five? suppose that I have, um, out of, let's suppose I have five participants, right? Mm-hmm. Suppose that I, one of these accounts has a balance of four, owes four dollars, right? And mm-hmm. another guy owes five dollars. Mm-hmm. And then the, and the, the other three are at negative four, negative three, and negative two. Once we resolved all the transactions, you know? Yeah. yeah. First step. So you, your algorithm tries to find the maximum participant account, right? So yeah. that would be this five. Yeah. Now, for each of these, so while the maximum amount is greater than zero, your participant account mm-hmm. would try and get, um, what, get things in order, right? Yeah. So you're trying to, so then you would snag this negative four. Yeah. And so that account balance would be updated to um, to what? It would be it would be zero, and then you have one left over. So if I can figure out a good way to do this, um, let me insert a table. Actually, it might be easier for you to see. So let, let's just do four, five, negative four, negative three, and negative two. Okay, so the first items we grab are five and minus four, right? So now our account yeah. will be updated to um, one and then uh, zero, right? Yeah. And then you're gonna try and supplement the next part into minus three because you're iterating through the account, right? Yeah. So then minus three will just become minus two, and then you can't, and then you cancel this guy, and then you go for the next one, right? 
Uh, no. Uh, so this line over here, uh, I get the max amount again. Okay. So that would get four. Okay. So okay, okay. So then you get four, right? Um, yeah. So then. So then here would be four. So let me let me let me put the next. Let me insert a mm -hmm. row below. So the next time you pull out this four here. So then yeah. you would try to resolve the minus three, right? Yeah. So then that would resolve this to one, and then zero. Yeah. Uh, zero. Okay. Right. And then mm -hmm. at this point, both these transactions will go to negative two and then that resolves that account right yeah so there are a total of four transactions that you've done yeah but what do you think the actual answer you're expecting here is uh uh three yeah that, that uh, five would give one. yeah five would give them negative three and negative two Okay. Uh, so, uh, without looking at it as an array, I was thinking of maybe it kind of re resembles a directed graph, but okay. then I'm not really sure what I would do after I would after I build the graph. Okay. Like if I like if this is a source, uh, the destination, and this is the way. Uh, even after I built the graph, I'm not exactly sure what I do to get the minimum number of transactions required. I see. So you, so the way you're thinking about it right now is that each one of these participants is a node and then yeah. each one of the, and then, but the thing is that you have to remember that each one of these paths is connected to another participant, right? Yeah. So how would you figure out uh, the weight of these paths? Because I assume um, that, the, that the direction is the amount uh, or direction and weight is whether or not they owe someone money and then the value of that, right? Yeah. So then how would you go about, if you're going to go down the graph route, how would you go about um, deciding that? How would, you, how would you iron that out? And how does your initial algorithm help out here? Uh, like uh, iron what out exactly? So for instance, you have a bunch of transactions flying around, correct? So then uh, you would just, so how do you plan on establishing these, uh, the weights of the, um, of the inbound and outbound lines? Mm. Like the weights, I guess, uh, would either be the value or one divided by the value. I'm not exactly sure. Why one divided by the value? Uh, well, the mo the higher the value is, the more money they owe, which okay, uh, which could in turn like mean less of a distance between the two nodes. Okay, but how does that help you solve the problem? Yeah, that's I'm not sure. I'm just kind okay. of spitballing here. Okay. Uh,
Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what how to go about this. Mm. Okay, does it mean you're throwing in the towel? Um, yeah, kind of, yeah. Okay. Um, sure. So, you I mean, made unless you've got a hint that you yeah, think I well, can... let's play it out. Let's let me give you a hint. Um, so you have so the first part of your of your code here, which scrolls, which I'm um, not scrolls, but uh which iterates through all the transactions and then establishes who is, who is owed money and who owes money. It's correct. Mm -hmm. That that's fine. Um, because you do need to establish that at some point. But the question okay. you're trying, you're facing right now is that you need to figure out how the num least number of transactions that you need, right? Yeah. So, and you need to be able to figure out a way of distributing money from all the debtors to all the co to collectors. So mm -hmm. would it not be, would the simplest answer not be to just try every single possible combination? Okay. Yeah. Mm. You mean, uh, like, try every combination of every, uh, like, debitor giving money to every creditor? Yeah, that's like the very basic way of doing it, right? That's the most naive solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. That would work, yeah. I mean, okay. I didn't consider that at all. Okay. So knowing that, do you think you can do the problem? Um, yes, give me a minute. Let me just think about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So since you mentioned like all those combinations. Hello? You got you're you're really soft right now. Uh hello? Yep. Hi. Uh yeah. Uh uh you meant like I was an audible, right? Yeah. Uh so uh when you mentioned that uh all combinations, uh do you mean like backtracking? Well, that's up to you. But the idea is that you would try every single possible way of distributing money from people who owe money to the people who need to collect money. Okay.
Yeah, I'm kind of giving up. I'm not sure. Okay. If you're throwing it, you're going to give up? All right. I'll stop yeah. the timer. Okay. So, while I'm, give, while I'm looting up the uh, recording, just give me your impressions of your performance. Um, well, it was pretty bad, I guess. I mean, I wasn't even able to think of the naive solution. And one solution that I did think of was wrong. Hmm. So, like okay, yeah. what was going? Let me let's dive into that. Um, what mm. was going through your head? What was your approach? What were you trying to accomplish at just in a general like a um at every single time that you can remember? What was your objective and what were you trying to do? Um, so at first I kind of based my I guess I based my solution off of this example, the one that was given. Uh huh. So that's why I thought I guess the the greedy solution would work. Okay. So uh, that's when I did this. But then after you uh, give me the other example, I realized that wouldn't work. So I tried thinking along the graph kind of thing. But then I wasn't sure what to do with respect to that either. Mm. Yeah. So that's kind of where I fizzled out, I guess. I see. So I'm going to tell you something like, and you're probably not going to like hearing it. Basically, okay. the way I see it is you have two very, very big problems. The first mm -hmm. one is how you practice. You strike me as the okay. kind of person who really just tries a problem for 20 minutes and then just gives up when you can't get the problem. So then you look at the solution, you try to memorize the solution to that problem, and then just roll on to the next one without really giving your problems thought. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly correct. Yeah. Okay, okay that's the first problem. The second one is you are playing, you are trying to look for a lifeboat and based in what you have memorized and you're hoping the interviewer will throw you a bone or the, your leak code problem will do it. In a sense, this is actually very lazy. Is that, would that be correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So you're suffering from the problem that I outline in the guide and in my videos of the person spamming leak code submissions. And I think, mm -hmm. it, and I think you're the kind of person also who is the, that you spam the leak code submission machine without really thinking through like what you're doing. Like if the compiler comes back and says your answer is wrong, then you actually end up just you know hacking together a fix and then trying again. Yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah, yes. I've got. It. Yeah, so I can already tell just like literally within that I would say within the first twelve to fifteen minutes I could tell what you what these problems. Um, and basically, uh, these are you have, these are your bigger underlying issues, actually, and I think is also playing a big reason why you can't recognize uh, problems because you never really thought of the characteristics of the problems themselves. You never thought through the problems themselves, and you just really try to rely on um, problems that you've done before to really carry you through newer problems. Yeah, pretty much, basically. Yeah, I mean, I just look for patterns and questions that I've done before and try to like mold them to new questions that I've seen. Mm -hmm. So if you remember reading my guide, you'll know that there are two parts to that. The first one is the patterns. Yes, that that's absolutely true. And I think patterns really help you get off the ground and give you a basis point from it to start. But you've completely neglected the second part. Do you remember what the second part is? Um, you mentioned that the second part was like understand about a pattern like, or an algorithm, like uh, what it, what you have. Well, wait, wait, you're, you're cut. You're you're. I can't hear you. Can you say that again? Oh, uh, you mentioned like for every algorithm, you should think of like what you have and what it gives you at the end, so that uh, you should, like try to and then like uh, that's how you should remember algorithms and try to apply them, so that when you uh, recognize that you have like a condition, you can up you can try to determine like which, uh, what algorithm to use depending on what you want at the end. Sure, that's how you parse it, yes. But that's also, there's also mechanical skills to this as well. It's being able to parse the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what you need to do is, that's what you need to do for your, um, in your practice as well. It's not something that just like you snap your fingers and it happens. Okay. And so the fact is that the, the basis of this problem is actually two parts. The first one is to be able to recognize it as just a graph where each one of the nodes points somewhere. It doesn't, okay. you don't know where. So you got that first part correct. Like, you know that okay. there's a bunch, there's a amount of value that goes out of one node 
and then goes into the other node. In fact, actually, if you drew this out and then you tried going through the problem, the easiest way to understand this problem would be through a graph. Okay. The second part of this problem is really just a combinatorics problem with backtracking. Okay. And so once you recognize that you, the naive solution is to try every and all possible combinations, then combinatorics should have kicked in. Okay. Because the, the entire problem is not solvable by a pattern for sure. But really, if you are able to break down the problem into a first part and second part and recognize the second part, which is combinatorics, this problem would have been super easy for you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah. uh, with respect to the back checking thing, that's one of my like, uh, like knowledge gaps. So I have like practically zero information about that. So that's why I guess I couldn't, I didn't even consider that. Okay, but even if you didn't know backtracking, you still could do some kind of combination check. Yeah, 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 I didn't consider that either, yeah. Yeah, so it's it literally just, how can you do combinations? That, 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 that's it. Um, okay. Can you, like, can you generate, if I gave you, the, the, the very basic version of this problem is generate for me all the power set of a set of numbers. All possible okay. combinations of a, an array of numbers. So like all the elements, all the arrays with like zero elements, one element, two element, three element, and four elements. Okay. That's the basic version of this problem, of the combinatorics problem. And this is just a glorified version because really what you're talking about is instead of generating these sets, you're just adding one number to every possible other number in the array. I'll show you the answer later, but let's go over the replay. So I'm sharing my screen with you. Mm-hmm. And so here I give you the problem, fine. And then for the first like um, five minutes, you actually you, you're talking it out, right? Yeah. And so you're you're fine here. I I think it's uh you're the fact that you kind of like just play with it, play with the first part is actually pretty good. That that's fine. Um, and then pretty much after five five to eight minutes, you just go straight up silent. And uh -huh. I'm trying to wonder what were you doing between five, eight minutes to like I think around sixteen minutes. Yeah, that was when I was coding up the wrong solution, I guess. No, you literally were silent. So if okay. I... Wait, so yeah, yeah, you are, you are, you're right. Um, yeah, you're, you're coding up the solution at 8 minutes, and then, like, here, you got to, you got to like, 16 minutes, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're right, you, you were coding the solution. But then, what made you believe that being uh, using the greedy algorithm would work was it just only because you tested against the example uh yeah pretty much yeah yeah so do you remember what i had to say about uh testing uh you gotta do it like you gotta i'm not i don't exactly remember where's your design okay you yeah. all you've done is really just kind of kind of hand waved the design you just said um, oh yeah, I'm going to do this, and then I, for every, and then try to um, uh, find the maximum amount or whatever. I don't really quite remember, but you seem to have some kind of plan, and I was curious to see where you'd go with it. So either you're going to do really well or really poorly. Okay. It, it, like these kind of interviews where the candidate usually doesn't design the algorithm and and or doesn't have like a very clear roadmap ahead. It's either very very good or very very bad. And I would okay. say weighted more towards the bad, I think on a 70 30 level. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, what I would have suggested you do is actually write out your algorithm in pseudocode and then uh, be able to generate like one or two test cases. Because if it turns out your algorithm is wrong, then at least I know that you tried and, and you had like a systemic way of approaching the problem and then you just had a blind spot. That one I probably could have forgiven. But um, the fact that you didn't do any of that, you had no planning, you had no test cases, you had no design. You just kind of went with it, basically eliminated any any second chance or forgiveness I could have spared. Okay. So yeah, like put your like put yourself in my shoes. If you see a candidate, yeah, that... just go do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, like no, like no thinking ahead, nothing. Yeah, I I get it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But like, I I don't want you to like get it on an intellectual level. I want you like actually understand it like not think you understand it. i want you to look at the scenario and really you know feel how what's the word um cringy yeah okay. for lack of it like if you look at this guy and he does exactly what you do what are you thinking 
yeah, it's it's just a train wreck. Yeah, but, but again, I don't want you to just say it because I'm telling you to like I'm telling you it. I yeah. want you to actually believe it. So, um, okay. and then after that, uh, like you know, you just keep coding, coding, coding. Um, and then you kind of throw in the towel at like 23 minutes, which I thought was like super weird. Because you know, this is a hard problem. I would expect people to throw in the towel at 30. So I would expect you to at least spend like at least 30 percent more time on this. Like and I. You, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, so yeah, that's when I tried thinking of the graph, uh, try to think of like uh, a graph methodology. But then once I realized that, uh, I mean, I tried, well, even after I realized that even after I constructed the graph, I didn't know of anything that would help me actually get the answer from the graph. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I mean, the graph would have been the first thing I would have done instead of the last thing, or just, you know, draw it out like a normal human being. Um, but I think it's okay for you to at least try that idea. I, I think that's fine. Um, especially if you're if you're not familiar with like the combinatorics patterns, um, and recognizing that, um, then mm-hmm. I think I think it would be perfectly okay to like try random stuff, but that also should tell you once you got the answer that you need to revisit, um, this particular pattern or this particular topic. Okay. Yeah. So that's the second part you missed. Do you remember what I said in the beginning about you just kind of chugging along with the problem and just you know going forward and just like hoping that whatever you saw in the last problem carries you? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. That's why, like, your inability, you have this inability to really recognize problems or characteristics of problems. You're basically relying not on the characteristics of the problem, but whether or not you've seen something similar to it before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's, uh, this, that's what I would recommend you do in the future. Like, when going forward, really understand what it took to recognize the pattern that you needed or the answer that you needed what were the key things and so uh the key thing would have just been to what's the easiest way for me to do the problem and then here i give you the exact i give you the example never ask a interviewer like this like oh can you give me an example you should at least try to generate the example yourself okay because coding like to go outside the interview software development and coding is much more than just writing code it's designing and engineering and creating something. And for us, because of how fickle software engineering is, tests are pretty integral. We want to, how do we know if our software is working correctly? Through tests. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, like there's a, there's a debate of like what constitutes a good test, what constitutes a bad test, um, and so on and so forth. You don't necessarily need to know that. It, I mean, it, it, it helps for sure. But you should at least have some sense of what you want to test um, doing this. And for me, I find that just testing every, testing the general um, cases and every possible case that you can run into, like um, it, what if it happens if everybody's zero balanced? What happens if like one um, particular guy has his um, split? Where the optimal solution is one guy just transfers his money to another guy directly and the one guy split? Or what if both guys split or no guy split? And so on and so forth. Okay. So j- just mm-hmm. keep trying to test that out. That's... um. That's basically what I would do for testing. Um, at least I can show then that I'm trying to cover all my bases. Okay. And then if I happen to miss like one pot, like little scenario, then the interviewer will probably be just like, oh, okay, whatever. But at least you had a systematic plan. But you, you didn't have that plan at all. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I gave you this one slu- I gave you this one ant- this one um thing. And you know, like th- doing something like this doesn't take that much time. Like, look, I only spent like two, three minutes on it. And that's with me talking. But if you like understood it, you could have just done it yourself, like in or like a minute or less. Okay. So, um, and then you give up again at, at minute twenty-eight. So, um, there's not much else to say about that. It's really just you not being not practicing properly. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. uh, this yeah, I'll give you the general. I'll give you the pseudocode for the solution though, in just so you can understand what's happening. Where did my... Oh, here's coding now. Perfect. So, hold up. Let me restart my uh, browser. Holy shit, it's taking up like 10 gigs of RAM right now.
Okay. So, um, I'm gonna stop share. Uh, I'm gonna go back to the dock. Okay. Um, so here, I'm going to use my cursor in red. Um, where's the cursor? Okay, so the first part of your solution is correct. Um, so for every transaction, uh, take out money from person who, uh, you know, who gives money, add money to person who receives. So basically what you did here is, is perfectly fine. No problem up until this point, right? Mm -hmm. That's fine. And then after that, what I'll do is like try every possible combination of um, uh, distributing money. So um, the way I'm thinking about something like this is I would, since I have to try every possible combination, then I kind of have to go in order, which means that um, I'm going to try giving my um, money from person zero to person one, person zero to person two, zero to person three, zero to person four, and so on and so forth, right? Okay. I'm gonna try every single possible combination I can of this. Um, and so the, but then there's might be some people like if say if um, for instance, person zero has too much money. So yeah, you have th three combinations. Person zero is greater than A, which is the person receiving the money. Then what happens is that we will, we will have to go back to person zero again, so we don't advance the index. So, but we will uh, trend, uh, plus plus the number of transactions, right? Zero equals to A or less than A. At, in either case, we will, we will we'll give the money and so let me just say person zero. We will give the money and advance index. Right? Uh-huh. Um, and so basically because of this, uh, my loop will look like for every uh, element at start index to end of array. We well, we'll, just, we'll call an array because array will rep with an array has number of indices equals to number of participants, um, just for shorthand. Um, oops. Okay. So then I will it try to find iterate right from uh would say um start index should we start index plus one because I need to find the next guy. Um plus one and then I will say give if the uh receiving guy guy at index plus one is opposite opposite of uh current guy guy then i'm then i'm valid which means that because the reason why i do this is because that either means the person is either receiving and the and the other guy is is giving or vice versa i am current the guy i'm currently on is giving and the other guy is receiving so the way i would test this is just account of cur guy times account of other guy is uh, less than zero because it's negative to represent that one guy owes and one guy is receiving. Okay. Does it make sense uh, so far? Yeah. Um. Uh. Just one thing. Like uh, you said, if person uh, zero is greater than a, we'll have to go back to person zero again and increase the number of transactions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this is I'm just talking about as if a person zero person zero has a, a has a positive account balance. In, okay. in the case of person zero having a negative account balance, you would just flip these. You would just flip the conditions. Okay. Because you need to find the... Uh, excuse me, wait, hold up. I just knocked my earbuds out. Oh. Because um, if person zero... So, like, if person zero ends up... Uh, you can't give person... You can't give money to a person when you owe someone money, right? Mm hmm so it's like uh and the person and then let's say the person we've chosen is also in the same position hey i like i owe money you owe money i can't give you the money i i owe to someone right yeah yeah so 
or I can't, and neither of you can receive. So, um, you you need to give it to the you need to give it to someone who needs to receive the money. So that that's a whole that's the reasoning here. Okay. Um, and so here, this is your condition. So if the if the guys are if the guys are opposite, then you have one. Then you go into this condition here. Either the um, what's it called? The we either have a person who owes too much. Either my current guy owes too much or not enough. Um, so absolute value of current guy account is greater than absolute value of new guy account, right? Or or absolute value of current guy account is less than equal to absolute value of new guy account. These are your two conditions, right? Yeah. So then here, um, if this is the case, then we will increment number increment num of transactions plus plus subtract subtract from new guy account from new guy settle settle make new guy account zero actually make new guy account equals to zero subtract subtract balance from cur guy well now at this point cur guy still owes some guys money or needs to give some people money right yeah yeah and then recurse recurse into here and then backtrack track undo this transaction okay follow me so far yeah yeah so we're gonna try this um and then here um if the current guy is less than the new guy which means that hey the current guy has settled his account but the new guy hasn't settled his account then we'll increment the in increment the index so we'll recurse recurse um, backtrack, backtrack, undo the transaction, which is like, which is similar to up here because trans. Make new guy account equal to uh, at minus, minus or plus equals depending of the cur guy account. Recurse, undo the transaction. Um, excuse me. And then advance, advance index to the next one, to the next guy. Because in this particular case, we still need to resettle, still still need to settle cur guy account, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then advance index to the next guy here. Uh, well, not next guy as in the guy we just gave money to, but index to plus plus. Next guy, index plus plus, right? Yeah. So now this means also means that um, if the guy is zero, that we will we'll find will not we won't fall into either one of these, and it's pointless, right? Because a person who owes who is have account value of zero neither owes nor receives money. Mm, yeah. So then, um, so then, for at every DFS or should I say recurse, recurse, um, skip all the guys who have zero at the front of the array. So, um, of zero balance. So you can do this a few ways. Um, you could pass in a start index as well. That's fine. You can also skip all the guys at front. Um, there's multiple ways of doing it, but this is the general idea of the optimization. Okay. So, uh, you kind of see like the roadmap of how to actually do this. Like, yeah, yeah. I might have like have some, I might have some, uh, bugs in there when I go to write it, but you fully understand the idea here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but then, uh, how would you combine this with the graph? Like, I don't get that. So the graph would just be, um, so the graph part is only for the first part. It's really just a visualization thing for me. Graph, it, like I said, the way you figure it out is by drawing the graph, but the graph itself and graph techniques are not necessarily applicable here. Okay. Like if you draw the transactions, from like uh, person zero, one, two, three. Um, I would draw an arrow from person zero to person two, um, and then just like say minus ten, minus ten person, you know, minus ten here, minus one here, and then uh, minus and then positive one here, um, just to represent. Oh, all the money that's been going out of his account, and then all the money that goes into someone else's account, and then let's say I add a minus uh, four here, and then four here. Well. Again, it's not so much that I need to remember who the person is, who I owe money to. It's just a matter of, it's just a matter of, are all the outbound connections, the outbound weight is equal to the number of inbound weights. 
So okay. it's not explicitly a graph for sure. You know, like um, it's not trying to connect nodes. It's really just uh -huh. the nodes are just a crutch to try and visualize what is going on. That's it. Okay. So it's not strictly a graph problem at all. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, any questions? Um, I mean, well, I don't think any more questions about the question, really. I mean, okay. I kind of get that I jumped in. Uh, too much. Yo, I you're mean, quite. You're cutting out again. Is oh yeah. Wrong with your I. Uh, no. uh, is this better? Yeah. Uh yeah. So uh yeah, I guess I jumped in way too early without testing. That was my first mistake. Mm -hmm. Um. And then, yeah, I didn't generate tests myself to even get the fact that I thought of the wrong point, uh, solution. Mm -hmm. And also, okay. you're, the way you practice. So you weren't able to recognize that what you needed to do, even when I told you what you needed to do. Uh, yeah, OK. So, OK. Um. Um, so, um, like. Is this uh like do hard questions really come during uh like internship interviews or? I mean, you should be as prepared as you can be, right? Yeah. Like again, mm -hmm. you, you were talking. Remember how you were saying like, oh yeah, you want to follow the idea of being able to um land offers consistently. Well, that means eliminating yeah, yeah. any and all possible chances of failure. So there is a po there is a chance that a hard question might come your way because at the end of the day, um you know you're competing against everybody else who wants the internship. So how do you stand out? And plus, like, mm -hmm. um, from my perspective, um, if a candidate can solve a hard problem like this pretty easily, then he's got pretty good um, skills already. He might just even get a return offer just off of that alone. So even then, you, you should just maximize your chances of success. And I think a hard problem like this is even not, it's not even that hard. It's just really, can you recognize um, two different um, things? Can you recognize two different um, techniques that you need to use? This is not that uh, hard. I've seen harder. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, so uh, pretend like you were trying to learn uh, like a new concept, like um, like you know, backtracking, for example. Like after you read the theory, how exactly do you practice on that? I would just do the grokking problems associated with it. Wait, I okay. think I have a whole section of how I learned something. And yeah, I think yeah. I, have a, I have a YouTube video of me actually studying as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just, uh, yeah, yeah, I've seen that video where you just like write out the, like the boilerplate code again and again mm -hmm. to learn that, okay. That's the first part. And the second part is to be able to try and misuse it as well. Um, try to compare it against other problems that I've done. Try to use that technique incorrectly, essentially. So that way I know when to use it and when not to use it. And if I ever run into like those symptoms again, if I could, then I know that I'm going down the wrong path that I can course correct quickly. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't really have any other questions about the problem, but I do have some other questions about like, you know, as a software engineer. Sure. Um, so uh first question is, is like uh, you mentioned in your like senior software engineer uh video that you made mm -hmm. that like uh you know you're giving out reasons like uh why not to pursue it mm -hmm. and um like you mentioned like having a work-life balance and a support system mm -hmm. and stuff like that like would you uh like would you if you could go back would you change anything about it it's hard for me to say because um at the time my life really lent itself to being successful, like it, like it, it almost forced me to because, um, you know, you just freshly graduated. A lot of people, um, you know, are going their separate ways. And then for me, it's just like I kind of felt, it was more like my mental state, where I felt I needed to do well, and also I wasn't very satisfied with just being, you know, an okay engineer. Um, and mm -hmm. so it was more like, even though I went back and tried to convince myself not to do it, I still think I would still do it. Um, just because it's more like who I am, really, because I don't like doing bad work. 
And mm-hmm. if I see something that could be done better, I'll always be thinking about how can I prevent this from happening in the future? Because if it happens again, then I just get very, very annoyed and pissed off, honestly. Um, so because of that, I will look up ways not to do it, not to have that problem ever again. So okay. it wasn't like, oh, I want to get promoted for the sake of getting promoted. It was more like I kind of, I kind of just didn't want to make the same mistakes and piss myself off again. And then by doing that, I just kind of landed in that position. But again, okay. it took a lot of work. And mm-hmm. I think if I had like a different life at the time or a different system at the time, I think things would have panned out differently. I think I wouldn't have made senior at the time, but I think I would have been much more relaxed about it. Okay. Okay. Because like, uh, I mean, like most people, like at least like, you know, you said that for you got it within four years, like most of them at least, uh, you know, like kind of stop at like mid level. At the time, like they're pretty happy with like you know getting a mid-level position with that amount of years of experience. Yeah. So I was like kind of curious as like what made you go on even more, like push yourself even more to reach the senior position. It was again, it wasn't really title. It was just like I just didn't want to do bad work, and I kind of figured at some point, you know what, the only way we're not going to run into these issues, like you know that stem from poor planning, that stem from uh. Commun- lack of communication, you know, these issues that you run into at a um, company is if you if you not only know what you're talking about, but you're also able to present that as well to other teams. And then, and you know, with your ideas, you re- it's like, you see so many bad ideas that you would rather try your own ideas. And if they fail, they fail, you know, and you would rather own up to that. Then at that point, you're pretty much ready. If you're ready to own up for other people's work. Okay. It's, then, it's, uh, mm-hmm. uh, like, I mean, like, did you feel like you're still doing bad work, like, even when you're, like, a mid-level engineer? Yeah, mm-hmm. like, I always feel like I'm doing bad work. I just know that I'm doing less bad than I was yesterday. Because, you know, like, one of the things I keep saying is that you're always going to suck, but mm-hmm. at least you suck, yes, you suck less than you did yesterday. Okay. Uh-huh. And, you know, over time, like, uh, it just kind of worked out because... Um, everyone, you know, everyone, most people don't have that. They want to have a life outside of work. They want to, you know, have families. They want to have kids. They want to see their friends. They want to take a trip over the weekend. And for me, it's like, would I rather do? Well, I don't have any kids that I know of, fortunately. <laughs> um, and for me, going outside at the time wasn't really an option because I didn't have a car. So the only thing left for me to do was really, okay, there's this really annoying piece of work in the corner that's my work. That's really annoying me, and I can't believe I'm making this mistake again. You know what? I'm going to spend a few hours just trying to figure out how not to do this again. Okay. Uh huh. So, again, it's a pretty abnormal situation to be in, I think, for me. But I think for most normal people, um, I think it's okay to not pursue that route because just because, like, even right now, um, I'm still, I'm still, like, you know, Uber laid off a bunch of people, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm still expected to perform. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. No excuses. And I, and I wouldn't give myself excuses either. Uh, I mean, are you looking to change? No, not at all. Oh wow. It's like it, I see it as an opportunity, actually, um, because it means that um, it means that there is a chance for me to be able to implement some things that I want to see. And I okay. do see there's a lot of chances for me to do that, um, but I first need to clean up my workflow on a new system. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Again, like don't don't just don't take that as like a um example to follow. I'm just saying what goes on through my head as a point of reference mm-hmm. just to show how like it, it, it's pretty extreme I would agree compared to what most people do. And so that's why I the point of that video was really to try and show people don't be like this because this is what it takes. Okay. Cuz I think people too many people get into this like you know, this mentality that is on blind, like, oh my god, I need to max out my total compensation, I need to get, um, what's it called, I need to get promoted every two years, I need to this, I need that. And as someone who actually has done it, I'm going to tell you, it's pretty freaking insane. You have to give up everything else for it, and you have to actually like, somewhat like what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And you have okay. to believe in it so much that you would be willing to give up everything else. And, um, you know, that's just the way it is. Uh, okay. 
But then you mentioned that uh, even like after you reach the like senior position, that the pressure is still on to do that sort of like work every day. Yep. Uh, so I mean, like, uh, like, like uh, I mean, do you see this like, uh, like as a long term thing? Like, I mean, uh, I'm just curious. I mean, because I have no idea. Yeah, eventually you get to a point where the system becomes familiar and easy that you can just kind of do it like, with a snap of a finger. Um, it, 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 like that's what I encountered at Apple. Actually, I remember I was given like this huge task of basically refactor our code base and ship and you know clean up all the legacy stuff, moving to best practices. It took me like four months. Was if you like, think about like an entire massive system that we have twelve developers on, being able to migrate it that quickly to something that's really stable and really fast. Mm-hmm. Four months. Four months of solo work is really not that long. Oh, okay. Yeah, so again, like, you eventually, once you actually really start under- taking the time to understand things, you basically become that central source of knowledge that everyone else can rely on. Um, and, you know, like, it just all really stems from how can I do this better? How can I do this faster? How do I stay up to date with what the best practices are? Has these best practices been proven? How do I know, what do I have the right answer and wrong answer? And it's really, like, like it's simple to say, but really doing it every single day, it makes you feel like shit. You know, like, like everyone talks about like oh his mentality you gotta hustle you gotta grind and I say no you uh-huh. gotta feel like you gotta be willing to feel like shit every day for three years and be afraid of being fired uh, every day for three years that, that that's like that's the way I see it and so I think it's um, very disingenuous to really um, follow these what, how do I what do I call them wannabe entrepreneurs and hustle porn uh huh yeah that's why I'm really against that it's like it's not easy I've done it and it's not fucking easy but then uh, you'd still say, like, you know, it was worth it at the end. For you. Yeah, it's like, I, I don't know if I can say it's worth it. I think it's just, it is what it is. Um, worth would imply that I got something out of it that I was expecting, and I never thought of it like that. Even looking back at it now, I still don't think of it like that, and I still don't see, um, see it like oh i got a title is so worth it i see it more like i learned i learned a few things that's and i could have done that at an at a mid-level mid-level um level as well but in order for me to actually not get how do i say um frustrated at the process it would have just had to i would have needed more responsibility um to do that and that's just really where the senior senior level came in okay so okay so like basically you wanted to like work on your own ideas and stuff and to do that you needed to become like a senior software engineer essentially that that's the short that's a short answer um yeah but like it's i want to implement the changes i want to see like i want to change our workflow i want to introduce testing i want to, more rigorous testing i want to be able to use i want to be able to use this i'm going to prove and in order for me to make these calls i need to prove myself and then by proving myself that I, that's when the promotion came and by and when with that i was able to do what i wanted to do Okay. Uh. And it's like a lot of the things I want to do wasn't like completely out of left field either. There's a big justification that everyone felt it, but no one really could do it. And so that was really an opportunity for me. Like, okay, well, I'm willing to do it. If you like, I'm willing to do it. I have a plan ready. I'm ready. I can do this. I just need to prove that I can do it. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things between, uh, between that and actually doing it because there's 10,000 ways of messing up, you know. And I think mm-hmm. it's more important to actually experience all those ways of messing up so that we, you don't do it again. And that's kind of like reflected in my process for studying in the um, coding interview. It's like, how many ways can you mess up and how many ways can you avoid that? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, also, you mentioned that you interviewed for people for like positions above you, right? How yeah. does that work? Like, so, how do you do that? So at Apple, you interview with the team that you are going to join. Um, and at the time I was a mid-level and we were interviewing people for a senior level position. Um, and so basically we, the, my boss at the time didn't really think that, uh, we still needed time to really grow into that role. And it was just better for us as well at the time because of where we were in the project to hire outside. Um, and so because of that, um, I was interviewing people who were senior and I remember that if, I made the case that we shouldn't hire someone. We probably didn't hire. We didn't hire them, but I think the 
few people that we did hire, I was genuinely impressed, not by the, um, not by like their solution or anything like that, but the fact that they were clearly very smart. They knew what they were doing. They had a plan. They knew what to do. And really, that's like, wow, that, that's something I can learn from this guy. And that was really it. Okay. That's pretty cool. I mean, uh, I mean, but then like, how, I mean, how did you even get the questions to ask them? I mean, like, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> how does that work? It's like when you've been, or when you do enough of these really intricate problems of engineering that you need to solve, like, these aren't like, how to describe it. The problems of engineering that you solve on a regular basis are not really problems of, that are like, you know, like, uh, Dijkstra's algorithm or some shit like that. The problem you really mm -hmm. try to solve is more so like developer productivity, design, and cleaning up legacy code. And so the natural question that arises from that is how do you avoid that to begin with? And the way you avoid okay. that is by thinking through situations and thinking through every single possible situation that you can. And usually these, this is where like, you know, how you kind of, uh, when someone's in a discussion and you say, oh, that's a good point. Chances are that person has thought has encountered that problem before and understands the pain point of that. And really the more that you can recognize these things that quicker and faster that you can do, um, the quicker and faster you can recognize them, the better off you are as an engineer because you know to avoid them. Because if, you, if they've happened before, chances are they'll happen again in the future and you already know the price that you have to pay in order to deal with that problem. And so really the difference between a senior engineer and and you know the difference between levels in general is your ability to it's not just a responsibility it's your ability to make the right call every single time like ch is there a chance that a junior developer will make a better call than a senior developer yes absolutely the junior developer might get something right you know that's not like no disrespect to either party it's just the probability of them calling the right thing is much much lower because the senior developer has seen through like like a lot of um shall we say death marches has been seen a lot of problems before, understands the consequences of making certain design choices. And so because of that, he is more likely to make the right call. And he's okay. capable of owning more responsibility. That that's really it. Okay. Um so when it comes to system design, like like uh, on making a guide for that, do you have any like uh, tips on like how do I learn that? Mm, I would say Read a lot of engineering blog posts, uh, especially okay. with the technology stack that you're using. I'm a mobile engineer, so I read a lot of Android-related stuff. Um, and okay. so, like, I, I did that one video of me trying to understand Netflix's engineering blog. Mm -hmm. And it was just me showing you how I think. That really took about an hour to do, reading that just one blog post. But, you know, it adds okay. up. Okay. Okay. Uh... But then, I mean, is that uh, enough, like, for interviews and stuff? I'm, I'm talking about, like, uh, from the interview side. From the interview side, so once you understand the blog post, once you understand the general ideas, all that's really left is for you to actually try them out, and I think just, like, grokking is pretty good. But I think the nature of the system design interview is that if you've never done it before in real production, then mm -hmm. you will have a very difficult time of those considerations as well. But once you've done it, or at least worked very closely with a system like that, then the rest of them just kind of feel the same, to be honest. Okay. So like, um, it's like, for instance, if you have a CI CD pipeline, it's mm -hmm. better for you to look under the hood and understand how it's all organized, why everything is built the way it is, why do you use a SQL database, what tables and values are in it, so on and so forth. How does every part integrate with each other? And once you really understand that and you understand why things are put together the way they are, then the system, then pretty much you've, master system design interviews and at least at the core the same way you can consider yourself a master of um uh algorithms and data structures you still need to execute on that idea though but at least you have the core understandings okay but then uh like um for like new grad interviews the and when they ask like system design like um I mean, how do we, I mean, like, I don't really have any experience building entire systems or anything. Yeah, you, know? you like, should even... never get that. You should never get a uh, system design question for a L3. Oh, okay. So, okay. So for a new grad, it's pretty much entirely just data structures and algorithms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you will get some object-oriented programming design, though. Um, if you're a PhD candidate, you might get an L4, but 
Um, like the person who got the second highest score in a Google interview, she was a mm-hmm. master's, and I think she said that they would not. Uh, I don't think they would do higher than a L three. Okay. But it'd be a. I think at her level and what she's doing, I think it, she'll be easily promoted to L four within like a year, year and a half. Okay. Uh, so I mean, like from your point of view, like uh, like doing a master's, is there like any like apart from like actually learning more in depth, which I guess you can do on the job. Is there any actual like you know like uh, a job uh, like plus point? Yeah, you can do machine learning and AI stuff. To be honest, um, you can do a lot more like a lot more interesting things with distributed systems, um, and I think that's where masters really helps. Like on my team at Apple. I was the only one without a master's degree. Mm-hmm. But then, uh, like, uh, I'm talking about like from a career po- uh, perspective. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I mean, like, uh, like I'll be interviewing. Uh, I'll be completing my master's next year, and I'll be interviewing for L3. But then, uh, somebody who graduated with just a bachelor's and also entered as an L3, like, it'd be on the same level, right? Like, there'd be no difference. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I think that's a that's probably the on a very simplistic level. Yeah. They would be, um, but it just really depends on how you perform at these interviews. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Apart from that. So, uh, at least for in like internship interviews, do you have any specific advice, like anything you've noticed, or you know anything, or is it you know just the general? data structures and algorithms i think honestly the there's really no difference between the uh internship interviews and the uh and the you know new grad interviews i don't think there's really too much of a difference i look for the exactly the same things okay like um as far as i'm concerned i mean i understand that um your object oriented design might be a little bit weaker but Mm -hmm. your core data structures and algorithms should be exactly should be pretty much the same Okay. Got it. Uh, do you look at resumes? I mean, uh, like, uh, do you mind looking at mine? Look uh, at that. sure. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Uh, okay. You don't mind. Uh, oh wait, hold up. Um, give me a sec. Okay. Um, I can take a quick look. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you just want me to email it to you, or? Yeah, you can email it to me. Yeah. Okay. This is pretty interesting, actually. Okay. So, um, first things first. I think that your education section is actually a little too big. But, I mean, I understand why, but you have quite a lot of experience that I think can take a more space. I don't think you need the. Okay. Uh, I don't think you need these courses, to be honest. Um, that's my that's okay. my opinion. Because like, you already have like all this stuff here, and I think you could even put more value on it if you really wanted to. Because these courses over okay. here, and they don't mean much compared to like what you have here. Um, you might sit. You might if you were gonna still do this, I would just still move. The, if you really are focused on it, I'd move it to the bottom. Just because okay. I think your your experience is much more interesting. Okay. Yeah, I might. Yeah, like um. College Station, Texas. I I reword. I try to figure out how to redo the these headers so that way I can um use more real estate space. Just because like like oh. you you, ha- you have a like a lot of real estate space and it's like I don't understand why you're not using it. You're you're dedicating so much of your space here to um to education. But then you I'm, have all this. I'm still a student, so mm-hmm. uh, right. right uh, I, I don't know from what I've seen online. Mm-hmm. Um, like education should be at the top at least I mean that's what people said that like you know when you're a student yeah it should be at the top but my point is that you're taking up a lot of space with it like it's already one fifth okay. of your it's one fifth of your entire resume okay and from my perspective it the only thing I really care about is like this and this mm-hmm. so okay if I if those are the only things I care about and you know GPA as well sure um, if those are the only things I care about I don't need the rest of this. Like I, I, I mean, like yeah, you can put your undergrad degree, fine, fair, but it's 
so irrelevant to the to everything else that is here that you know why is it taking up so much space does that make sense okay yeah yeah so you'd say remove courses i would move courses to the bottom okay because i think highlighting your education highlighting the 4.0 gpa is so much better um and if you really want to okay you can go ahead and do the undergraduate degree but i don't think it really matters because the strongest selling point of your education is Texas A&M, so. Oh, okay. The, the undergraduates mm-hmm. are like almost not even relevant in that regard. Yeah, yeah. Person. So th- th- that's my thoughts. Um, okay, mm-hmm. so the first things first, use Gerda, use Gerda o- open source uh, reverse engineering. Um, that's highlighting your what you tools you used. But I'm more interested in what the impact is. So this is like, I, I why do I care? Okay. Why do I care if you use it? What did you do uh, this for? Okay. Mm-hmm. What was the purpose? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, develop Python scripts to scrape the instructional architecture and automate generation of instructions. Um, so it sounds like you're reverse compiling a, a GPU and then trying to figure out its instructions. Yeah. Okay. Um. The automate the generation of instructions, I think, is what's throwing me off. What do you mean? Okay. Um, so uh, to actually encode the instructions, um, you know, in the platform, uh, it has to be in a specific like a format. So mm-hmm. I generate, uh, but then the that doesn't come uh, in the in inst- the instruction set architecture. So uh, I basically like wrote a script to just like uh, spit out the encoding direct like from sc- scraping the pdf huh i didn't understand that um like uh so the the pdf the instruction set architecture pdf only has like the only has like really basic information about the different instructions and stuff but then the actual encoding requires some more uh added stuff in that like it has like more than a so um, I basically wrote a script to, like uh, scrape the PDF and generate the extra information required. Oh, you're just scraping the um, you're just like updating the information of whatever was given in the basic instructions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a lot less. Um, how do I describe it? It's a less it's a lot less sexy than I thought it would be. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, like, it's cool, but like. It's just essentially just word scraping and parsing together. It's not, it's not that it's not that's great. I th- I would try to upsell the experience somehow. Disassembled okay. over five hundred instructions of operations load compare failure with various scalar encodings. Um, I this this sounds cool, but I don't understand it either. But that's because I'm not a hardware guy. So, um, I still think it's pretty cool. I think it still think it's pretty cool if you're able to disassemble some instructions. I think that alone already tells me a lot. I don't understand like the significance but i know understand that is pretty cool so compared to like all the other ones i would move this up front okay it's like make the make the idea sound sexy in an engineering sense does that make sense Mm -hmm. yeah i mean just make it cool yeah make it sound like you did cool shit like you decompiled a gpu compiler or something or whatever you know you um you reverse engineered a fucking gpu gpu instruction set or, you know. Okay. Mm-hmm. Something like yeah. that. It's like, whoa, I have no idea what the fuck you're talking about, but that sounds super awesome. Like, 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 like I want that <laughs> oomph there. Um, Ericsson, okay. Okay. Design an application to automate the process of mapping test killers. Okay, this is the ICD. Um, okay, road design. Yeah. App. Okay, um, I think this is fine. Uh, design an application. Did you write the application? Yeah, I wrote the application. Just to then say design and write. Okay. Uh, wrote Python scripts to automate the entire task. The entire task integrated then with continuous CI/CD. Server Jenkins for daily feedback. Okay, so whenever someone pushes uh, like their code, um, you this uh, script will run to just do automatic tests and just say whether or not it passed or failed. Uh no, like uh, so the developers like push code all during the day and then tests are on during the night. Oh. And then, uh, but then. Uh, uh yeah so but then uh like so they get the results back in the morning and but they're not sure exactly which uh like failure was caused by which commit mm-hmm. 
So my job was to like map out which failure was called by which uh, commit exactly by which mm-hmm. developer. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, because like from because I'm used to environment where error code does not land unless the all tests pass. Uh-huh. So that's that, that's my background. So I understand. So, but when you explain it like that, I was like, okay, fine. Um. So then automate the entire automate. So I would say automate the entire task, integrate them with continuous integrate for daily feedback. To, I would say test build cuts. Test nightly test nightly build cuts. Just because like it t- oh. it already it tells me everything about the workflow as well. Uh, okay. Okay. Reduce manual effort to over six hours to less than thirty minutes. Um. Sure. Sure. I can't believe you're doing this manually, though. Yeah, it was. Holy shit, <laughs> dude. I, I like if if that was me having to manually do it, I would just hang myself, dude. <laughs> yeah, I mean the the responsibility of that was like shifted, you know, like every couple of months to someone else, to, like uh, someone else in the team, like yeah. continuously, so that nobody gets like too bored, I guess. Yeah, I would be freaking bored. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so technical skills, fine. Projects. Um, I would, again, I would move this to the below, but just because I'm more interested in your projects and work experience rather than I am your technical skills. Um. Okay. Build a platform in Python, support multi-client streaming. There's enforcement. Learning algorithms to support maximum quality experience. Um, basically to prevent buffering. Or yeah. quality. Okay, cool. Um, fine. Use a wireless access point to place what streams in high and low priority keys to update in real time. Okay, that's pretty cool actually. Sword buffers. Okay, this just getting the technical implementations. Is there like any impact to this uh project? Like user user engagement? Uh I mean uh this is actually part of my master's thesis, so we're like uh like running different algorithms and trying to like, you know, uh like publish them basically hmm. like uh yeah That's like we have cool. like the dif- yeah we have different like algor- uh, like uh, so since i'm a master's i'm just handling the actual implementation of it uh mm-hmm. there are like phds who are actually like uh, writing new algorithms so that we and then we code it up do you have any metrics for this uh like as of right now no because like this we're actually still running tests but then like my job was to just build up the system so that we can run tests Okay. And like different, run different stuff on it. Okay, storage bus. Uh, then this implementation, honestly, I don't really care. Like, um, I get you're trying to show that you work with these technologies, but then why not just put them in the technical skills section? Oh, okay. Like you worked IQ uh, or like this shit. Um, because I want to mm-hmm. know more about this project. Like, um, because uh, I think it's I think again, it's got that sexy factor to it. Hmm. It's like, uh, okay. give me, give me, make me want to know more. Like, I, you probably made me want to know more about it. So then, feed me something like the results of it, or, or like okay. it, it can be initial results as well. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. Developed an application to transmit data to and from voice control headsets to a screen to help doctors from trauma babies. Um. What do you mean to a screen? Uh, so, um, I mean, we just had a, like, a, like a display screen set up, which mm-hmm. is connected to a Raspberry Pi, which would, uh, get data from a mobile phone and uh, display instructions accordingly. Okay. I see. I see. Um, so it's just really communicating from phone to screen. Cool. Okay. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. fine. Like a Chromecast, uh, design system, consistent mobile phone. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. What instructions for what? Computer instructions uh, so or instructions for the doctors? Instructions for the doctors. Okay, spe- be more specific because this sounds a little bit weird. Um, um, okay. Improve the system to handle to a hands free model or using risks and percentages, numbers. Uh, okay. I think mm. uh, it's like improving. So, yeah, it sounds like it would improve. So, basically, you are, instead of uh, people treating the premature babies, in person, you're doing it over a inter- over the internet. Uh, no, not exactly. Like, uh, so there's an um, like there's an app right now, uh, which uh, like doctors and nurses use uh, to help treat newborn children. 
but then uh, there was a problem that they couldn't use the app because on the phone, their phone required one hand. Well, and they couldn't use the other hand to properly treat the baby. So we had to improve it to a hands-free model. Oh, why don't you just say uh, that? So, you know. Like, um, the whole purpose, like, instead of saying, um, fuck, uh, yeah, like, just restructure th that to just do what you just said. So at least you have the problem statement there. Like, you understand what mm -hmm. the whole purpose of it is. Okay. Yeah, why don't you just like um do that? Um, because you see, like you have a transmit data to and from headset. Why not just also go with the problem statement instead? Okay. Because like when I'm looking at this, I understand you're helping to treat premature premature babies, but then where does the app come in? You know. Okay. That sort of thing. Yeah. And then implement a wireless control scenario because it does so the users under certain constraints under. I have no idea what the fuck this is. Um, uh, yeah, that's kind of a like a wireless communication project. I'm not exactly sure how to phrase that in terms of like software development. Then just tell it to me as if I'm a five year old child. Okay. Um. So, oh man. Um. So I mean, there's basically a system uh to help uh reduce um uh, like uh, to reduce power consumption in a wireless scenario uh -huh. and we implemented an algorithm for that which uh reduced it by like which improved throughput by 6.5 percent see that wasn't that hard okay uh-huh okay yeah just say hey uh we just made our we made power consumption more efficient between wireless devices okay yeah mm. okay but then yeah i was trying to like how you said make it look cooler but then i guess that went into like what the fuck territory yeah like you just gave me a bunch of random fucking jargon so this doesn't sound cool this sounds like fucking lame okay like i have no mm -hmm. idea what the fuck you're talking about it's like be it's like the difference between um being smooth with your words and reading out of a dictionary and you're reading out of a dictionary right here it's like the difference between shakespeare, yeah yeah the difference between re between shakespeare and the difference between just reading a fucking dictionary okay yeah Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay. Yeah. But that that's all the feedback I have. I think your your the core of the experiences are very good. Just sell it better. Just sell it better. Okay. Um do you mind sending me like this revised draft? Yeah, sure. I'll just I'll send it back to your email. Oh, okay. That's great. Okay. Alright, is there any other questions that you have for me? Um uh, uh no not really actually. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it really helped. I mean, uh, I can't believe you're actually doing this for free. I mean, I'd pay. Yeah, don't worry. You do this again, I'm going to make you pay. Well, actually, no. I have, yeah. a, pol <laughs> I have a policy where it's like if a student needs the help, they, I give I give them the help. Um, that's really it. Uh, oh, okay. But yeah, like, I, I mean, I do have a paid section as well. So if you ever feel the need, mm -hmm. you can always use that. But I usually try to reserve uh, the free section for students who are, um, you know, who are struggling and need the help. Um, so mm -hmm. I try to tell people to be very careful because, you know, this is just, like, something I like doing. Like, it, it, it's really nice to, like, help people out. But at the same time, mm -hmm. if you can afford to pay, you better damn well pay. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Thank you so much, once again. Yeah, for sure. All right. Take care.